So in the previous lecture, we, we um, gave the correspondence principle, the generalized correspondence principle. In this lecture, I just want to apply that to a very simple beam bending problem uh, just to show you how it works. Um, so th th this will hopefully be a pretty straightforward application. So what we're going to do is we're going to begin by uh, considering the solution for a viscoelastic beam in pure bending. Okay, so, so here we go. Consider uh, a viscoelastic solution okay uh, for a beam in pure bending okay so what does that look like well let's draw a picture here's our beam okay something like this sorry it's not perfect okay let's on one side it's going to be fixed okay the other side we're on a roller something like that okay let's go ahead and define our our quantities so there's our y-axis our x-axis is going to be in the center of the beam and for pure bending we're going to apply a moment okay so the moment here is going to be a function of time or we're going to allow it to be a function of time okay so let me I'm not going to uh, solve this problem from a sort of sophomore level mechanics and materials I'm hoping that that's straightforward for you Let's just write the solution down. So let's just say from uh, mechanics of materials, okay, the elastic solution is d squared w, where w is the deflection, dx squared is equal to uh, the moment, which is a function of time, divided by ei. Okay? Let's call that equation one. The stress which is also going to be a function now of time and also the, uh, the, the location on the beam, so it'll be a function of y as well, is going to be negative m, which is a function of time, times y over i. Okay? Call that equation 2. And then the, the um, strain, epsilon, again, a function of time, uh, and and position uh, through the beam thickness y is going to be just the stress divided by the the Young's modulus. So it'll be m as a function of t y over e i, right? So there's our elastic solutions. We could go we could solve for the slope and we could solve for the actual deflection. But this uh, these will illustrate what we want for the sake of showing how we use the correspondence principle. Okay, so now what we want to do is apply the correspondence principle. So we want to apply the correspondence principle, okay, so to, to get the viscoelastic solution. All right, now remember that the correspondence principle lets us find the elastic solution and then basically modify it in Laplace transform space to get the viscoelastic solution. So let's go ahead and apply these steps. So uh, step one is get the elastic solution. Let's just say the elastic solution is shown in one, equations one through three. Okay, uh, it's going to be given uh, in one through three. Okay, and I, I obviously I already gave that to you. I'm just trying to be uh, consistent. I gave you a, a series of steps to apply in the last lecture for using the correspondence principle. So I'm just writing uh, sort of where, where each step comes from. So we've already uh, given you that step one. Uh, step two, we're going to take the Laplace transform of the elastic solution, okay? So take the Laplace transform of the elastic solution. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, this first term is going to be d squared w bar now, the Laplace transform term of dx squared uh, is going to be equal to uh, m bar, right? divided by e i, right? Those are just constants. Call that equation four. Okay, one thing I'll just point out, you might be thinking, well, wait a second, the w was in a derivative term, shouldn't we have uh, multiply that by an s? Remember that the Laplace transform only operates on the time variable, it doesn't operate on the spatial variable x, okay? So then the next equation, uh, the, st the stress term, the Laplace transform of the stress is just sigma bar, and that's going to be equal to um, negative y over i times m bar. 
call that equation five. And then finally the strain, Laplace transform is just epsilon bar. And uh, this is gonna be negative y over i uh, times m bar over e. Okay, call that equation six. Okay, what's step three? Right, remember step three is replacing the Young's modulus e by either sy bar or one over sj bar, okay? So replace e by either sy bar or by one over sj bar, okay? They're equivalent. So let's, if we do that, and we're gonna, we, we can choose whatever one we want. Um, we want something that's gonna let us most easily take the inverse Laplace transform. So in this case, we're gonna choose replacing E by one over SJ bar to make that happen. Okay, so in the, in the first, in equation four, we can write then that D squared W bar over DX squared is equal to now M bar uh, over i, and if we replace one over, uh, e by one over s j, then one over e just becomes s j. So this is just s j bar. Okay. Uh, let's call that equation seven. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do just a little bit of algebra to pull out. Obviously, i being uh, um, the the moment of inertia that's going to be constant just depends on the the geometry of the the beam uh, times this this quantity that looks like j bar s m bar okay how about for sigma well sigma is just going to be um, uh, sigma is going to be negative y over i uh, m bar nothing really changed there call that equation eight and then epsilon is going to be negative y over i but now we have this, we, we do have E there. And so this is gonna be um, uh, M bar times S J bar, or I could write that as negative Y over I times uh, J bar S M bar, right? Let's call that equation nine. Okay, step four in the process was computing any desired quantities additional to, to that we might need to compute from the Laplace transform we've already computed in this case everything we want to know okay so um, the desired quantities are already computed uh, in equations seven through nine okay so then the last step is to get us back into the time domain so step five is uh, inverting the laplace transform so inverting the laplace transform uh, gives the following so the inverse on the left-hand side of equation seven just takes us back to uh, d squared w dx squared, right? Equals, now we have the one over i term. And the inverse Laplace transform of, uh, well, let, let's, let's uh, see what happens here. We know that s times the Laplace transform uh, is, is the Laplace transform of that dot, right? So we could have written this if we wanted to as one over i of j bar times m dot bar, right? And similarly here, we could do the same thing. Negative y over i of j bar m dot bar, okay? So now we just have the, the problem of what do we do with, with two functions j bar now and m dot bar in, in in laplace transform space taking the inverse laplace transform turns out that that is actually just a, a convolution integral so we can write that as uh, so this first term becomes integral from zero to t of j times t minus c times m dot c dx c okay let's call that equation 10 how about for sigma? So now this is, uh, everything's a function of t now instead of back in Laplace space. So if we just uh, take the inverse of that, well, nothing actually changes from the elastic solution, right? This looks like uh, negative 
m is a function of t times y over i, right? Equation, that's equation 11. And then how about strain? Okay, we do the same thing that we did in equation 10, except we have this, uh, we have a negative and then we have y in the numerator, so negative y over i times the same integral, integral from 0 to t of j t minus xi, uh, m dot xi d xi. Okay, let's call that equation 12. This is the solution. This is the application of the correspondence principle. Um, is, it, is it what you expect? Um, one thing that you, you might be wondering about is, well, why didn't the stress change, but the strain did change? Okay, so let me just make a quick remark about that. Okay, so we observe that the stress is independent of whether uh, the material is, is viscoelastic or not. Okay, so we observe that sigma of t is independent of uh, the elastic, viscoelastic nature of the material. Nature of the material. Okay, but, but the strain and the, the deflection terms are, right? Okay, so but the strain, epsilon of t, and uh, let's say w of t and derivatives uh, are dependent. Okay, why? Does it make sense? Well, think about it. If we're applying a load or a moment, um, it still requires the, the forces and the moments to balance, right? So it had better be the same solution, whether it's viscoelastic or elastic, or else the loads won't balance, right? So we can have some deflections that change, but if we're applying a load, those loads must balance. Um, so the stress can't change uh, apart from the applied loading um, or else we don't have a, an equilibrium problem, okay? So why is because the forces and moments uh, must still satisfy equilibrium. Just because we made the material viscoelastic doesn't mean we get to violate equilibrium. So that's why uh, when, we, when we did this particular problem, the stresses didn't um, actually change.